Okay, hello. Um, this is a video, uh, I think I'm going to call it an estimation rather than a review of the game of Baton Rouge. Um, I call it an estimation because uh, if you want a fuller review of the game, I gave an overview of it some videos back. And then, of course, um, there were the playthrough videos, which give you an idea of how the game actually plays. So that would be a kind of like a review of the whole thing. Um, this is more a little summary and my estimation of, of the game itself. Um, uh, this, is a, this is not going to really do justice to the game, which I think is a good game, um, because uh, I finished playing the game about a month ago, and uh, uh, since then we've moved apartment, and I had a parent visiting, and etc, etc. So much has been going on, I've been so busy, I haven't been able to get back to this, and uh, so I, I think I wasn't even able to finish the playthroughs, because... Um, had to truncate it because of the move. Um, but I, I, I want to wrap uh, this game up. Um, and uh, I did do a review about a week ago, but somehow I lost the uh, file in between the, my phone and sending it to, or between my computer and sending it to upload on YouTube. So anyway, I'm doing this again. It's not ideal conditions being so far from it. Um, this is, the, anyway, let's get to it. This is the map. Um, you can see I've started another game, ignore that. Um, I put the map up here so we can look at that. Uh, okay, there it is. And um, it comes from the Strategy and Tactics magazine. It's uh, actually, I think, 20 years old today. No, uh, 25 years old today, um, so we have to take that into account, it's an old game. So you get some interesting information in the magazine about the, the situation itself. There's um, uh, a confederate assault to try and retake um, the, uh, the capital city of Louisiana and uh, defended by um, a Union garrison here. Uh, the gunboat, uh, some gunboats, and an ironclad on the river. And the, the attack was to be coordinated by uh, two, two divisions uh, operating overland, and then um, the Arkansas uh, Confederate ironclad was to come in on the water. As it happened, that the ironclad never got there in the actual battle, but... Um, in this game, there's a chance it can arrive. Now, you get a uh, magazine insert, so there's, what, 44 to 21. So there's 24 pages of rules and charts. You get um, charts for the Arkansas arriving, leader casualties, vessel versus vessel fire, vessels ramming other vessels, union picket detection, because the... The um, situation begins early morning with a uh, dense fog, so the Confederates have a chance to come up and surprise the Unions, uh, um, simulated by do their pickets detect them or not before they get adjacent. So the first four turns of the game are quite exciting as the uh, Confederates are trying to, um, to uh, penetrate as far as they can, not operate their manoeuvres under cover of the fog and uh, catch the Unions napping. Then you have uh, the Great Battles of History uh, style assault results, morale checks, morale barrels, modifiers, um, and the fire combat results table with uh, explanations and adjustments. Then you get in the centre, you get the roster sheets. So you have the Confederate Expeditionary Force and the Union Garrison here. And uh, some explanation at the bottom. You have the uh, uh, different differing gun effects, terrain effects, density of hex adjustments on fire combat, uh, movement, stacking restrictions, formation prohibitions, and then the action chart. Now, as I said, uh, uh, and uh, oh, and the uh, lastly. 
on the last couple of pages you get the random events chart. Um, so there's quite a lot to this game. It starts out as a standard Great Battles of History, but what I like about this game is the turn continuation chart. Now I know this is going to be quite contentious because many people didn't like the turn continuation table, sorry, TCT, um, because it adds so much time to the game. But I find that is, is what makes this game quite exciting. Um, so what else do we have now? Uh, we have the counters, which I have somewhere else. Hang on, let me see if I can find them. I'll just pause this. Okay, so here are the counters. There's not too many. So it's, it's a magazine game. You have the Union, the Confederate forces, and then some uh, markers for... Uh, various effects. There are not enough of these markers, as, as you can see uh, already in there, there's some that I've built up myself. But um, that's not too much of a problem as a gamer. Um, find your own or, or make your own. So here's um, Breckenridge, the overall Confederate leader. Yeah, I added a splodge to it because otherwise when you glance at the board, you can't distinguish him so much from his subordinates. And I wanted to distinguish him because he gives extra bonuses to the subordinates. Then you have interesting, you have a lone cavalry unit. And here's the um, standard unit, that's the front. Here's the back shows the routed side. Uh, then there's uh, guns. These are batteries of two pieces of each, I believe. Let's get that from there. Um, the boats. Okay, so you have similar on the uh, Confederate side. Uh, on the Union side, but um, there was a bit of a printing problem with this in that they printed black on dark blue, which doesn't show up very well. Except on some of them, some of the leader pieces, the reverse side is right on the dark blue, which shows up much better. So there's a bit of an inept. This is the um, read W version of strategy and check practice. It's slightly inept printing there, but that's fine. You can see the map I really like. It's very clear and it's it's interesting. So um, let me start with my estimation of the game. There's a few elements in this. There's my personal one. Um, there's the, um, the differences between other great battles of the American Civil War series. And then there's um, the, the situation itself. So what are the game mechanics? Do they work well? What's the situation? Does it work well as, a, as an exciting game? And then what's my overall sort of estimation? So um, let's start then with the game mechanics because uh, um, what's, so what is different from this from the normal great battles of the American Civil War is the turn continuation table, and then the um, effect of the city hexes and the city blocks, and then um, the kind of extra effects of the colour you get from the situation in the uh, having the fog, um, uh, rolling for pickets, and then the, um, the boats. So let's start with the TCT. I like it because. Um, I speak as a, mainly as a solo gamer. I played this game solo twice, and it, both times, although it took a long, long time to do, I thoroughly enjoyed it. That works fine as a solo gamer. And I think it's okay to estimate um, war games with that in mind, because so many war gamers are solo gamers. If you were playing this opposed, then you would have to find the appropriate partner who did not mind spending so much time um, 
to get into the details of this system. Now, apart from being the, the normal great battles of the American Civil War system, whereby you have details of different gun types, etc., so there's quite a few. You don't just sort of roll to hit. I mean, you have to check which gun type is firing at who and um, factor in various other things like that. Um, apart from that detail, then there's, uh, which slows the game down, there's the TCT. But this is the thing, these details all add colour to the game, and that's what excited me so much about this game. I really had a, felt a good evocation of being in the battle. Um, you know, obviously, I don't mean being in the battle, but like when you read a book, it evokes something to you. It isn't actually the thing, but it evokes it for you, brings you a sense of what it was like, or what it is like, and what it can be like. And I think this game does that very well, bearing in mind that um, it might take as long to play it as the actual situation took to, to bear out i.e. a day. You have uh, I think 25 turns here, which is from 4 o'clock in the morning to 7 o'clock at night. These um, first four turns are in fog, then you have the sun, which can affect, um, if the, the Union basically are looking into the sun, so um, they get a minus on their hits there. And then after 11.30 you have heat turns, because this was in June or July or something like that, no, August. So units start getting exhausted quite easily. So again, that's more detail that the game brings in, which for me is more colour. It makes it more evocative, and I really liked that. Um, the TCT chart. Well, so it's not an I go, you go, and it's not a chip pull mechanism. The I go, you go has its benefits because it's simple and it doesn't take too long, and each person can take their time over there, but the other person can kind of sit back, do something else, or, or contemplate their next moves. Um, the chip pull is a bit more exciting, a bit more interactive, because you don't know, say, who, which leader is going to be activated next, so which side is going to get a turn next, or some variation on that. The turn continuation is, is a, even more of a kind of uh, a breakdown of that chaos of war, um, and uh, the player excitement factor. Because what happens is that every action is rolled for. So, for example, you, you, you might want to move a whole brigade, so that could be uh, four or five regiments. Um, or you might want to fire them. Or you might want to change their formation, their facing, or you might want to assault them. Or you might want to do what's called an uncoordinated action, which means um, a unit that is not commanded by a, by a, a brigadier. Um, so, for instance, the cavalry might want to move, or some units uh, out of the command range of their leader might want to move. Um, a leader might want to move on their own, or you might want to do an administrative action, which is to rally or promote somebody after one of your leaders has died, or to do the naval segment, or to resupply from a supply wagon. Now, all of these are actions, and each one is rolled for in the sense that um, um, you are rolling two dice, and uh, if it gets within a certain range, it's the Union, another certain range, it's the Confederate, or on a seven, it's a random event. So you can see random events are very common. Um, and there's a possibility at the extreme ends of the scale for that, that turn to be finished. Well, the action phase, essentially, it's the end of the turn, then there's just a sort of administrative and morale effects to take into account. But effectively, that would be the end of that 45 minutes of game, of, of, uh, game turn representing 45 minutes. Um, now, so um, th what this means is that you might move a brigade up to assault and then you lose the, that um, initiative to the Union and he decides to fire with that brigade. And the, that, the Union may get another initiative and then he may 
the side to assault you. So you might move up, get fired on and assaulted before you have a chance to do anything about it. Or conversely, you might move up, you might fire, and then you might assault before they have anything to do, chance to do anything about it. So it leads to a very exciting gameplay. And, uh, um, and it might sound just completely chaotic and random. It's not, because certain leaders have bonuses to that. And especially if you're a higher leader, the uh, overall commanders are nearby, they might give you bonuses in that. So if the leaders are in close accord with their men and they are good leaders, they get a better chance to re regain that initiative and to press the attack or to um, uh, finish through on the, the movement, you know, change formation and move, or change formation, change facing, and then fire, etc. So, it, it, better leaders get to do more and more often, and I think that is realistic. And uh, what it means is that you get nice asymmetric, the nice asymmetry of um, gameplay, in the sense that here, the, although in the terms of strength points, they're about evenly matched, the Confederates, obviously, who are attacking, have a harder job to do, because Union um, don't have the burden of attacks. They're not trying to wipe out or push away the uh, the other force. They're just trying to stand their ground, and their ground includes a city with dense city blocks as well as more open areas, which they can use as kind of strong points. So they roads to create bottlenecks, and then eventually they have a breastworks here, where in the, is their arsenal, the kind of back line of defence. So um, the Confederates, their generals or their commanders generally have better um, initiatives, so they have more chances of gaining initiative on the TCT. So that advantage is towards them, which enables them to press the attack, because without that, with the equal forces and the other side being on defence, they wouldn't stand a chance. So I like the term continuation table because of the colour and the excitement it brings. Um, no turn is the same, and it brings you have difficult decisions because it can create some kind of it can feel a bit bit unrealistic in the sense that say if if there's forces engaged desperately here, each side when they gain the initiative they might move one of these or, or activate one of these units. Um, because that is what is pressing at the moment. There may be another axis of attack over here, which doesn't get addressed, because each side is trying to respond to the other here. And then what could happen is that the turn ends before anything has happened over there, or very little. Now you might think that's, that's unrealistic. You've had 45 minutes of real time. While they were fighting, these lot would have been doing something. Well, yeah, yes and no. Um, they may have been stalled for whatever reason. It could be factoring batting, or um, they may be waiting for the other guys to press the attack, etc, etc. But if you do want to balance um, it out, then you will ignore what's going there and move them forward, and then that will cause the other guy to have to address what you're doing. So you can balance it out, but uh, um, it feels right, it feels like it gives a good tempo of a battle to it. Um, so I, I, I think it's a, it's a very good system for that. And the only problem with, with it is that it does take a long time because, as you see, every action has to be considered and rolled for instead of just um, one side doing everything and the next side do everything. Okay, or, or, or even the chip pull where you're not rolling for it. It's just coming straight out of the cup and you're responding to it, more or less. On the chip system. So um, that's the TCT. I like it in this game, uh, although it takes ages to do. Now, um, I'll just give a quick plug for this game as well, which um, apparently its predecessor, 1862, was full of holes. I don't find this full of holes. It uses the TCT, but in a, a modified version, so it's not as detailed. There's not as many actions to roll for. I think there's three or four. Uh, but so it and it it's operating at the brigade level, whereas this operates at a unit as a regiment or battalion, depending on the side. So um, if you like the TC, if you want to consider the TCT, but would find Baton Rouge too detailed, have a go with it here. Okay, now that's another Richard Berg game, another oldie. 
Um, and this again is the great thing about being a solitaire player. You don't have to worry about your opponent not being into the game. If it's old and disregarded, doesn't matter. Give it a go if you fancy it. Okay. You don't have to. You don't have to come to agreement with your opponent. If you don't come to agreement with your opponent, you throw it out halfway through the game. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's the TCT. Now, what I, I mentioned earlier, um, the fog effects, heat effects, the union picket detection, the ships. So you've got all these, li these charts um, that aren't complicated charts at all, or all these little rules that aren't complicated rules at all. Again, they add to the time of play because you have to you know, shift through papers or check something, roll something, um, some, to make something happen or, or, or to see if something's going to happen. I think it works very well. I love the element of the fog and then the boats. The only trouble is, is that the greatest chance is the Arkansas never arrive, arrives at all, as it never did historically, which is kind of like a disappointment. And then if it does arrive, the chances are it gets sunk very quickly. And this drops uh, back and ridges the Confederate commander's morale, which is not a good thing for the Confederates. So as a random event, you have a chance to check for the Arkansas arriving. Often I wasn't checking because I didn't want it to arrive yet. I think it's, it's kind of like a gaming situation, is that you only really want it to arrive maybe towards the end if you need it, to get, give you some relief from the cannonading uh, Union boats as you've reached this far and this far and the, the day's coming to an end, you're trying to clinch the or capture of the city but the boats on the water are proving too much of a trouble for you. I actually found that it wasn't that necessary because the artillery fire from the shore is extremely effective against the boats. I don't know if that's true historically, but um, the four Union gunboats only have one strength point each, so one hit from the Confederate shore um, battery, and they're out. Um, so the boats. So yes, the boats is kind of it's it's quite it's very simple and quite abstract. It works well, but I found it disappointing because it is weighted to, I guess, the historical result, which is that the Arkansas, and so, so you know, it's, it's good and realistic in that sense. The Arkansas, the most it can do is come on and kind of push the others out, that they sort of move out of the way, presumably feeling it, the weight of its fire too much. They sort of go off out of action for a while and then come back. Um, generally, even if the Arkansas arrives, it's going to be um, under such heavy assault from the other boats that it will sink sooner or later, maybe after sinking one or two of them. So, the, the ship uh, component of the situation in the game is such that it doesn't have affect a lot of the game it's like an extra factor to take into account so it's nice that you have mechanisms to deal with the possibilities there um, but it, I find it doesn't affect play that much because essentially because of the line of sight rules and um, this being kind of like a plateau line of sight the gunboats can only fire up to this edge on direct fire Beyond, anywhere beyond that, they are using indirect fire, which is extremely ineffective. You know, it's a very small chance of it doing much at all. So it's a factor, but a smaller factor than one might have kind of like hoped for or expected, which I guess is, is realistic. And it's, it's worth finding that out because you might think, oh no, I better not go down there because of the boats. Try it. Try it and see what happens. Um, now, fatigue and exhaustion, I mentioned the heat effects. So with a turn continuation chart, you find that each, um, each uh, unit has, let I, dot, I photocopy and doctor these up to, to make everything a bit clear. Each unit it has its strength points here, and then it also has this, which is um, the actions. So you have uh, fatigue, what's called fatigue actions. There's one, two. Then 
after doing two actions, the third action you become fatigued, which means you gain initiative less often, and there's a chance of you becoming exhausted. If you're exhausted, it essentially means you do very little for the whole, the next whole term. So that's 45 whole minutes, and a possible, say, three or four other actions that units around you are doing. So that bears um, a lot of weight on the game. How far do you push your units? You know, I want to give an extra bit to capture that, to, get, to outflank them, but then how effective are we, going to, are we going to have any energy for the next 45 minutes? And, you know, the men may be exhausted. Um, and factored into this is the morale of the units. So to go from fatigued to exhausted dep um, depends on the morale role. So some units, particularly on the Confederate side, are very high morale. So they can push themselves a bit further. I really liked that. Um, without, whereas the Union units, the morale is generally lower. They're not going to be pushing themselves so... Um, so far, because I guess because of inexperience, they, they get exhausted quicker. Um, and then with the heat effects, chances are you get exhausted more easily. So later on in the game, the whole thing slows down. Um, so, uh, um, I don't know what else do I need to mention. So I think I've kind of covered that. I think you kind of get the idea of my estimation is that this game, it does what it represents, I think, well. And in some cases, very well in the sense of the turn continuation chart, the fog, and the exhaustion and so forth. Um, but it's time consuming. Um, but I think the only thing that I haven't mentioned yet is the city part, because apart from the boats, that's what makes this a different game, is, is that from the rest of the American Civil War situations that the model that I'm trying to move my arm in mirror image it's easy um, is, is the city so um, so Burke was tackling here boats turn continuations fog effects etc and then the cityscape and the city city rules are essentially odd in in that I don't mean odd as in it doesn't quite work I mean odd as in different in that we're used to the normal hexes, and so you can move down hexes through the city as long as it's not too dense, and you'd either you'd be uh, considered to be moving on the road, or you can move into a block. Now, when you move into a block, you would actually I'll cut all the units away. But um, let's see if we can zoom in a bit. Okay, so um, if okay, you're in that hex, fine. Then if you move into this hex, then this, then this, then this, you're on the road. Or you could go into the block. Now you just put your counter in the block, anywhere in the block. It doesn't matter because you're considered to have all round facing and adjacency to any hex um, that that block touches. So you can shoot into any road which are adjacent, and any other block across the road will be effectively two hexes away. Um, so it's, it takes a little bit of getting used to. It's quite easily done, and some of the, uh, the counters from the game are to show when you're in block mode or when you're in um, modified line. So you have line formation, column formation, and then modified line formation, which is half firepower, it's, but it's not a column. So but it's effective for moving through the, the cityscape, otherwise you would have to be in column. Um, I find that it works quite well, the mechanisms work quite well, they're not too complicated, although it took a bit to get my head wrapped around it and I had to write out my own sheet to, to sort of get, get my head to it from the explanations. I don't find I find Bergs has good ideas, but I don't find he explains them very well in rule books. Um, not clearly. I think he probably explains everything in what he says, but it's not clear repetitions and, and, and stuff, muddy things. And also another thing that I find with a lot of Berg games, uh, and especially perhaps magazine games, is that um, I think they get designed, and then they get play tested, and things get dropped. They get designed, and they get rules are partially written, 
and then in the playtest if things get dropped or amended and that rule section might be then rewritten but a reference to it in another place might get forgotten and so here yeah, there are a few ambiguities in the rules that um, had changed in the process and hadn't happened. The rule that had been thoroughly revised, presumably because there wasn't enough time to do it. So I give forgiveness for that, and I'm not paying massive bucks to buy to play one of these old games. You might pay a lot of money to buy an old game and have it as a collection, but I I pay. Well, oh, this in fact was given to me for free, which is why. You know, so but um, I, I, I tend to buy older games cheaply so I can play them, so I, I, I can forgive them for their imperfections. And I understand it because um, they didn't have a lot, you know, they're, they're not massive teams working on this. It's a few people not getting paid a lot to do something that could be quite complicated. Although they could get better at it than they sometimes do. Um, so, this, I think the city stuff works quite well as a mechanism, though I find it a bit strange. Again, historically I was unsure, because what I found was that um, you, would, you could place a, a unit in a city block, so particularly one of these, not an urban block, which is lighter, but a heavy city, heavily congested city block, and they get a great defensive benefit. It's hard to push them out in, in assault. I didn't even try it because it looked so difficult over my phone. Um, they, the, they have half firepower all around, um, and so you'll think that they, they will create quite a strong strong point. But in actual fact, what I found was that, okay, um, somebody's in a city block here, or let's say somewhere else, say there's a city block here, and you actually need to get by, I would just run my brigades down the street past them, a regiment at a time, um, Union battalions don't generally, depending on the size of it, they're not necessarily very big, so they don't have a lot of firepower, half firepower. And I would take my chances, and some of my regiments might get stopped or, or even right back, but some of them might get through. So I don't know how realistic that is, is that you would find like a battalion in place in a city block and a brigade essentially just running down the street past it. Maybe that would have been attempted maybe, um, in rash situations. But I don't think in real life many, many units would consider running regiment by regiment past an emplaced position which could fire at them without any, taking any fire themselves. However, in this game that wasn't and that was quite an effective tactic. A little bit risky, but then as the attack really so you, you have to take some risks, definitely. Um, so you might say then the mechanism doesn't work very well. Well, I, I find it works as a, as, a, as a mechanism and it's um, in the, it does the job, but is it completely believable as it is? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, I don't suppose there's that much city fighting in the American Civil War for people to, to check their history to, to compare and find out. Um, okay, what more can I say about this game? I, I think it's a wonderful game. I congratulate Richard Bird for designing it and the efforts to think of some, think on a new situation and uh, to, to try and resolve some of its, to try and resolve it into a game. Um, the Great Battle for the American Civil War, I think, is a, is a nice system. Uh, if you like the tactical stuff, especially if you like tactical games because of the colour and the evocation of the situations, then this, I think, is a great game. If you like short games, this is not a great game. If you... Um, um, the... the uh, the materials I think are fine. I mentioned a few problems, like some difficulty of seeing some of the units, but otherwise they look nice. Um, they, uh, they function well. You need to print up some more stuff. I mean, I doctored my inserts to make it more playable. 
all time, as far as I'm concerned. What I suppose the last thing I've had to say is the situation. This is an interesting situation to be chosen for a game. Because, as you can see, you, you have two divisions. One comes on here, one comes on here. And then you have, you have some union... Um, Get, uh, some union regiments here, and then the rest are kind of scattered back here. Uh, so essentially for the union it's a either a holding action or a fighting withdrawal. Um, they try, they're trying to... They, if, if the Confederates get beyond this line, they've won at least a partial victory. If the Confederates take the state house here, they've won half the, the job. And if they take the uh, arsenal as well, they've completed the whole job. That's the kind of um, points of levels of victory you have. Um, it's an really exciting game because there's movement and maneuver potentials around here and here, and then also this street fighting, which has more interesting maneuver than normal because, like I said, you can run down streets, you can go around city blocks, you might even skirt them completely so they don't even get to fire at you. So it's interesting, the movement in the city. So you have the normal sort of combat, American Civil War combat we're used to. We've got blanket trees, blanket um, open ground, streams to cross, etc. And then you've got these, these roads to run down, um, blocks to skirt around. It creates a whole different feel. And then the, 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 uh, this area here is the state penitentiary which is a massively high wall around this whole area, which effectively creates another interesting situation for the game, because you have two axes of advance, probably. I mean, you might, you, you can come in one axis, or you could bring both them on this axis, if you like, but generally your two Confederate divisions are coming in this way, and you, you're, they're going to get a line of communication split all along this line here. Now you might think, okay, it doesn't, it doesn't take up a lot of the map, but this gets the critical point, because you can imagine the Union is scattered here. As they start falling back, they start, um, uh, their line starts narrowing, so they're becoming stronger as they fall back. And the potential is, is that, that you have um, half the Confederates here, half the Confederates here, and their leader has to decide, do I aid this side, so help press the initiative, and accept that side, or this side, the line of communication is cut, and the Union can take advantage of that, because they have the interior lines here, they can quickly shift, right, you're pressing here, okay, Shh. you're pressing there, okay, and the Confederate have to get past that point before they can then regain their line of communication between the whole force. So I think that gives you some idea of um, my enjoyment and excitement about this game. I hope that uh, if you like what you hear about it, it enthuses you to take the chance and buy the game, or if you haven't played it and you have it, to give it a go. Um, and uh, maybe leave some comments on one of these videos for what you found subsequently, um, after being prompted perhaps by, by this. So um, that's the end of my uh, treatment of Baton Rouge for, for you guys out there. Uh, I hope you liked it. I hope to do more of these treatments. I hope not to take so long in between sessions anymore, um, but I will be doing them as and when I can. And uh, next up will be the Gamers Austerlitz. Well, not for about a month. <laughs> okay, that's it for now. Uh, happy gaming.